Catoctin Creek is a proud supporter of Bourbon Pursuit. At Catoctin Creek, they pride themselves on making traditional rye whiskey as it would have been made in the 1800s. Virginia grain, Virginia water, Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. This is brought to you by Smooth Ambler, a proud member of the Bourbon Pursuit family. Smooth Ambler builds on the traditional roots of American whiskey through innovative blends, proudly sourced whiskeys, and a unique line of their own homemade bourbon and rye recipes made in West Virginia. So venture off the traditional trail and go see them in Maxwellton, West Virginia. They'd love to welcome you to the family that they're building around their whiskey. Wilderness Trail is sweet mash Kentucky straight bourbon and rye whiskey made by master distiller Shane Baker and fermentation expert Dr. Pat Heist. Whether it is high rye or weeded, cask strength or bottled and bond, Wilderness Trail is always non-chill filtered premium whiskey with unparalleled flavor. Distilled, aged and bottled in Danville, Kentucky. When you first hear about sourcing in this world, you almost get like this negative connotation to it. And you think, I don't really know. I, I'm i only going to buy from brands. And I believe me, I was one of these people too. I said, I'm only going to buy from brands that produce their own whiskey. And then five years later, here's me coming out with my own sourced whiskey. It's Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon, featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. We've talked about it plenty of times on the show before that starting a distillery is no easy task and figuring out how to bankroll it is even harder. Do you end up trying to tie up all your money into equipment, putting down a lot of liquid and waiting a few years, hoping the whiskey's good, or maybe even doing some clear spirits? Or maybe it's even smarter to supplement all that with some sourced product. But whether you think that having a product at your distillery only produced by you is something that you believe in or not, you have to understand that this is a business that has to survive. But beyond that, how do you scale, distribute, and even sell your product? Well, Scott Schiller from the Thoroughbred Spirits Group, he's launched over 30 distilleries, he's designed over 50 brands, and has facilitated three successful exits. And he joins the show to talk about everything I just mentioned, but Scott also has a fascinating family history with spirits, where he learned how to distill with his grandfather at an iconic Chicago tavern called Bucket of Suds. With that, enjoy this week's episode, and now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. Uh, This week's idea comes from at PCROC on Twitter. When are labels going to sport QR codes uh, that tell everybody everything about the contents inside? I think this is a great question. Um, When I was uh, in Portugal about 12, 15 years ago, no, no, so whatever 2010 was, uh, that's 11 years ago. My God. So in 2010, I was in Portugal with this wine QR company, this guy who made QR codes for wines. And he was talking about how it was the future. And it was really fascinating to me. And I, cause you know, this was at the, there was so much new technology coming on board to, uh, on bottles at that time. And he was really behind the QR code. And he was like, this is going to replace everything. And, and, and he was, he was largely right. And it works in wine. It doesn't seem to have uh, you know, transferred over to bourbon. Now, I know there are some people who are using QR codes on bourbon. You know, most famously, uh, Bullet Bourbon used a QR code uh, to activate uh, in an augmented you know, reality you know, with what they were promoting as their tattoo editions. But you don't see it as widely used for what's inside the bottle. Most of the QR codes are like a promo of some sort, um, you know, some kind of activation on site. But um, I, I think it would be cool if you did a, hit a QR code, and then you could see like the fermentation, you could see the uh, distillation. I mean, I think it's definitely on the way, but you've got those bottles, you know, there's not a whole lot of real estate there. And QR codes take up a lot of space, um, you know, at least what I've seen and when done right. But uh, I think keep your eye on it. I think it's something to definitely keep your eye on, something that uh, is possibly the future here. But 
um, I, I don't think it's a priority right now for anybody. But that's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you want to be like P. Croc, hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, or just go to fredminnick.com, click the contact button, and let me know your idea. Until next week, cheers. With every release from Barrel Craft Spirits, from their bourbon, rye, rum, and American whiskey, it just can't be duplicated. Find out more at BarrelBourbon.com. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny here today riding solo, but this was an interesting topic that I saw because this is uh, this is coming out a little bit later, but there is a conference that happens here in Louisville and actually happens around a bunch of different places, and that's the ADI conference, the American Distilling Institute conference. And one of the things I like to do is look for new and interesting guests or new and interesting topics that we haven't had on the show that we can explore a little bit further. And this is one that I saw and I said, this is, I think our audience would really like this because we reach a ma- like a crazy amount of different kind of people in this market. We reach consumers. We reach consumers that want to be more educated about what distillers and what NDPs are doing. We reach distillers. We reach brand marketers. We reach everybody. And so this was something that I saw and I said, okay, this is something that is kind of like that insider baseball stuff that people want to know about. And especially for people that are new to the industry and you're thinking about starting distillery, you're thinking like, oh, maybe that's a lot of money. How else can I get started doing an industry or getting in the industry? And of course, there's the S word, which is sourcing. And I think when you first hear about sourcing in this world, you almost get like this negative connotation to it. And you think, I don't really know. I, I'm only going to buy from brands. And I believe me, I was one of these people too. I said, I'm only going to buy from brands that produce their own whiskey. And then Five years later, here's me coming out with my own sourced whiskey. So it's one of those things that you kind of end up growing a a fascination with it. You understand why people do it and you kind of see how they put their own spin on it. So today we're going to bring an expert on the show to be able to kind of talk about whether you should source or not. So today on the show, we have Scott Schiller. He is the executive director at the Thoroughbred Spirits Group. So Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kenny. Great to be here. Thank you. So before we kind of dive into it and stuff like that, I'm sure you didn't grow up your entire life thinking like, I can't wait to help people figure out how to buy barrels. Kind of talk us a little bit about how you just got into whiskey and the spirits business itself. Yeah, happy to. Um, so it's my grandfather. Um, I'm actually a fifth generation distiller, but I'm not a fifth uh, actual physical distiller. And the uh, what I learned from my grandfather, and he's Italian, and so in his Italian way, he said, son, you need to think beyond the still. And that was his way of basically explaining that it's a marketing-based industry. You know, he grew up in uh, Chicago, his, uh, my great-grandfather uh, from Acera, Italy, and they were fruit farmers. And what many farmers did back then, what they do still, still do today, and what many farmers here in the U.S. do, you find a way to preserve your crops and to maximize their value. And so uh, they eventually became um, distillers. And my great great grandfather married. It, it, hold on, is yeah. this in Chicago? No, sorry. Okay, this, this is, is back Italy. in Italy. Yeah, okay, okay. This, this is back in the homeland. Okay, this is back in the homeland, the motherland. And so uh, my great great grandfather married very well into a family that were tailors, physical, you know, clothing uh, tailors to the court of Naples. Uh, this is the mid eighteen hundreds, and uh, as a marketer, I can embellish this as much as you want. That's okay. Uh, it sounds like the. But, it's like yeah, <laughs> marrying into royalty right there. That's awesome. <laughs> Not quite, but. Uh, great grandpa, what I can accurately track is great grandpa came over, uh, in Chicago, 1901, uh, went through Ellis Island and so forth. Last name was changed slightly, uh, not to his desire. Uh, but in any event, do you mind sharing yeah. what the names, what it, what it was? Absolutely. What it so it's Deanna. So it's D apostrophe A and an A and it got shortened to Dano, like Hawaii five O. Um, <laughs> that's nice <laughs> at the time. Um, so, but in short, you know, I, I learned the business from him. And so I knew at a very early age what I wanted to do. I happened to get more involved in the commercial side of the business, the stuff that happens outside the still. Uh, I have great admiration and respect for what happens inside. It's magical, it's art, it's science, uh, it's a labor of love, it's passion. But unfortunately, it's a lot more than that. And that's the insight in, and uh, reality that I often bring to the equation. And uh, before we you know, get much into it, you know, I still love the first part. You know, I, I I love all that stuff. I love love the production side of the business, 
but we, it's it's marketing and um rarely is the best tasting the best seller uh you know you go into a bar and you're like wow i'll have a gin and tonic you know and it's the g- brand it's that whatever happens. happens to be there that they got a great deal on or whoever pushed them or somebody was best able to distributor kind yeah. of got them a deal yeah. yeah totally so you know and and that's changed a little bit over the last you know i'd argue 10 15 years uh but it's still the reality and so you you've got to basically combine both sides of the business the the production side and the commercial side and so uh that's what we try and help do so what was the what was so you're rolling back the hands of time here a little sure. bit. So uh, your grandfather, right, yeah. here in Chicago, or in mm-hmm. Chicago is when he started, what company was it that he founded and all this sort of stuff? So the what he's most known for is, so is Deanna's was the, uh, Danos, uh, forgive me, Danos was what it was uh, resurrected to in 1901. So uh, great grandpa started a distillery in 1902 and a brewery in Milwaukee in 1903. Uh, so had, had both parts come down. And in 1920, uh, the expression is we're Italian, but not that Italian. And actually got out of the business. Uh, but uh, great grandpa and great grandma started the second pizza house in the city of Chicago, known as Dano's Pizzeria. And in Prohibition ended 33 in December, great grandpa and grandpa got the first retail wholesaler license in Chicago. Uh, and then in 53, uh, grandpa left the family business, got tired of working for mom and dad, and started the Bucket of Suds. Bucket literally became world famous. Uh, Elvis signed the bathroom wall. And what my grandfather did is brought the family talents together of restaurateurship and distilling. And so he created over 80 proprietary spirits, everything from liqueurs to blending of whiskeys to uh, actually American cognacs. Yes, I said that correctly, American cognacs. And uh, he created all these different types of spirits. And when I was 14, yeah, my grandfather was also known as the jazz uh, musician and uh, the jazz philosopher was his show or what would be known today as a podcast. And so he would bring on jazz artists. And uh, as a jazz musician myself at a young age, uh, my parents allowed me to come down to the bucket as a young boy. And for my first night there, I fell in love. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, being around the spirits, bringing around the bottles, the passion, the excitement, the hospitality that comes along with all that stuff. Um, So it's in the blood, but it's also really in the heart. All right. So you got to explain to people that aren't native Chicagoans, like, yeah. come, like what is Bucket of Suds? Bucket of Suds. So the, the, it was an institution. The reality is that Bucket of Suds was meant after the old 49er miners themselves. And so they would bring a bucket of beer. And so that's where the Bucket of Suds came from. And so on the building, it was a three-story building and you had um, a huge neon with lights with a bubbling beer coming down the side to the entranceway. Uh, but Bucket of Suds. Name was rather misleading because he served two beers, uh, <laughs> Oftaker and BB Key Light, uh, which are still my two favorite today. Wonder why. Uh, but everything else was alcohol. And he had um, a 90 foot bar, eight rows deep, all different types of things. And so if you've ever been to Delilah's, Mike was a big fan of my grandfather's, and there's a lot of corollary between both establishments. That's very cool. Yeah. I think a lot of people that are in the whiskey world have at least heard of Delilah's Absolutely. In, in Chicago. If you haven't yet, go check it out. It's a, it's a punk rock whiskey bar. So Super cool. Yeah, go and check that out. Super cool. So your great grandpa got out the right time. I mean, there were so many things that went wrong in Prohibition sure. that everybody just kind of lost themselves. Granted, I think, you know, 10, 11 years ahead of it, but still, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's quite the story to be able to say, go ahead, get out of it, and then get right back into it. Uh, after after it ends yeah well perhaps just like yourself but you know when you find the interest and passion towards this like you don't want to leave it uh it's one of the few industries where it really speaks to people um which is a lot of what we'll i think we'll share a little bit about today too is on sourcing yeah so so your grandpa who taught you to distill right you're grandpa. 14 you're, so you're 14 at the bucket of suds <laughs> Where was the distillery? Was it at Bucket of Suds? It was at Bucket, It yeah. was at Bucket of Suds, mm-hmm. and there were 80 different types of spirits that you were ma- yeah. learning to make. And, and so he kind of just held you by the hand and kind of walked you through it. Do you remember some of those early days and kind of like what really stuck out? Can't forget. Um, my favorite thing was the uh, limoncello that he'd make. And uh, just the the sense, I can still go back in my mind. And he also made a, a product called Elixir Lucifer. Um, which was this really beautiful vanilla-based or vanillin-based uh, liqueur uh, that was very reminiscent of his homeland. In fact, it was that that recipe that I resurrected as my first spirits business after college. 
Um, gosh, we're going to touch on so much. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> but yeah, so he had a small pot still, just to clarify. Um, a lot of it was uh, rectification, right? Didn't make his own neutral uh, for sure. But then uh, some of the brandies and so forth, he would do that. Okay. So you, you learn to start making all these different kinds of spirits, limoncello and uh, whatever. What was the vanilla one called? Uh, Elix Elixir Lucifer. The Elixir Lucifer. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I hope you still own the the brand name for it. That's a, that's a pretty... Pretty cool. Uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Okay, so you're 14, you start learning the distillation side of things. Now it sounds like you're... So you're going to high school, going to college, kind of talk about how that sort of played into it and where you sort of fell into the distilling side and the spirit side still. Sure. Um, wow, you're making me have some really good memories here. Uh, so that interaction... Uh, I define hospitality as another way of expression of love. And so my grandfather's spirits, that was his way of communicating love. And seeing the interaction between what he made with his own hands, what came across the bar and the reaction and the true uh, relationship he had with people, that deep connection, I want to be a part of it. Now, 14, I didn't have these words just to be clear, but there's something magical and you can feel it. You know, it's like when you listen to a great concert and you get get that vibe or you meet your first love or you know, something magical happens like the child of your birth, but that experience lived, lived on. And again, I didn't have the words for it, but I had the feeling. And so um, instead of going to high school football games, I, I went down to the bucket, you know, and so it was, it was in Chicago, I was in the suburb kid and um, came home late, uh, but always spent, spent my time in there. I ended up spending all my summers with him. And so when I went to college, um, I picked a school that would focus on entrepreneurship. Uh, so I went to Miami of Ohio, and at Miami, they had an entrepreneurship school. And so as a freshman, I was very clear on my path. Uh, wrote the business plan as a junior, um, came in second place in the Ohio State competition because it wasn't feasible to start a distillery oh, really? uh, back wow. in, that would have been what, 2000? Yeah, 2000. <laughs> so It wasn't feasible to start a distillery it in wasn't, 2000? It wasn't, no. no. It, um, nobody cared But they much. liked the effort. Yeah. Uh, so that was cool. And then uh, in any event, um, so I graduated, moved back to Chicago after school and worked out of my parents' basement, got started. Uh, my grandfather, which you might appreciate, was a massive collector of pre-prohibition whiskey. And uh, I believe that at the time he had the largest collectionist in the country. You can find some of his bottles actually at Delilah. Mike, uh, Mike may have come across them somehow. Yeah. But uh, I sold those uh, to start my first business. And so um, we did two liqueurs, both after my grandfather's recipes, uh, launched that, grew up into six states of distribution. Um, eventually uh, did a trade show in Las Vegas called Nightclub and Bar. And about two weeks after that trade show, we got a call. So we're a Midwest company, Chicago based. Uh, so we're in Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, Kentucky, and um, got a call from the uh, Alabama ABC. And we're like, we've heard about your product. We'd like to carry it. We're like, this is great. This is wonderful. This more. is how these trade shows yeah. work. This what have, is, we, what, what have we been doing wrong? Why did we wait so long? What's next? So uh, it's a control state. So you can ship whatever you want. The, they buy it when they deplete it. Um, so freight and everything, we just shipped a pallet. What do we got to lose? A week later, we get an order. Again, like to refill our warehouse. We're like, that's way too good. We barely do that in Chicago. Two days later, we get an order for three pallets. Turns out there's a school called Auburn University, which happened also to be the name of our product because um, of the color. We chose it because of the color. The school sued us. Uh, it took our law firm in Chicago uh, 30 days, uh, which is our limit to find a firm that would represent us because oh, wow. either they had worked with Auburn in their illustrious past or were a Tiger fan uh, and therefore wouldn't go against their university. All kidding aside, um, they sued us. It was a six-figure settlement, totally took the wind out of our sails, and we lost investor confidence. So we stopped. A year later, uh, I went to go work for a member of my board who owned a flavor company. So I set up a um, alcohol division for his flavor company, and he really inspired me. Um, on a very personal note, uh, he really got me recentered, uh, got me back into my faith, and gave me the confidence to move forward. And so this time, I uh, built a distillery in Brazil, made cachaça, and bought a whole bunch of cognac barrels. Uh, so we're going to do cognac. So this is like 2005, 2006. So sourcing is not foreign to me. Uh, we just did it with cognac versus bourbon or whiskey. 
and grew that business. And as we were growing it, um, it's 2008, 2009, those of you may remember, the economy wasn't the best. And we were on our third round of investment and realized that we could either just have a really nice, slow growing business or we could really go for it. So we started talking to strategics. Uh, one of those companies happened to be Brown Foreman. And uh, we were going back and forth with their head of M&A and uh, he met him in Louisville. They came down to Atlanta, a guy named Ted. Uh, my girlfriend at the time um, was a phenomenal baker of chocolate chip cookies. Uh, nothing compared to my wife, but she made- she <laughs> Nothing, made nothing good, makes a deal go over well uh, some chocolate chip cookies. But we pulled out all the stops, baby. And uh, so we, we brought these chocolate chip cookies out and showed them our business and everything else. And they said, we we're going to have you come uh, to Louisville and make a formal presentation. This is great. This is wonderful. Went to uh, Bachrock. You may remember Bachrock. They had the uh, customizable three-piece suit so you could fit just as you was. So you looked tailored, but you weren't. And bought a new suit, flew to Louisville, and uh, we thought the CEO was going to be there. Uh, head of M&A was supposed to be there, and Ted. CEO wasn't there, uh, but the head of M&A was. And in about um, 30 seconds of pleasantries, <laughs> he goes, your business of, we were doing around $9, $10 million at the time, was essentially a rounding error to us, uh, which was hurtful, but was really true, unfortunately. You know, to Brown Foreman, that's nothing. And uh, I said, well, uh, I realized I wasn't going to get anywhere with the M&A guy. And I said, Ted, how do you build businesses? How do you build brands? And he goes, Scott, we don't. And Ted said, probably the most honest thing I've heard in business, he goes, we buy big brands and make them smaller or larger based upon our actions. So the ability to build a true business from scratch and really scale it is really hard. Uh, I know, I've done it twice. First time, not successful. Second time, we ended up uh, selling uh, the business uh, to a private family. But one of the ideas I had, which was to be an incubator, and because I knew Brown Foreman and, and all strategics, they have money and distribution power, which is the two things I didn't have. I had, we had creativity, we had great salespeople, we had great brands, innovation, work our tails off, all those fun things. But we didn't have influence where it really mattered to really scale. And so I came up with the idea to be an incubator within Brown Foreman. We could take our two little rounding air brands uh, and bring them into the mothership. And as they scaled appropriately, uh, we could have a, a set buyout, uh, not unlike what Constellation Brands does today and you know, Diageo, et cetera. And he says, I love it. Figure it out. But we can't, you know, the name of my company was uh, uh, JD Anna, which is after my grandfather. And they're like, we don't want an Italian name. As and I said, okay, got it. So I took the weekend. And I went to Woodford, one of my favorite distilleries. And on the tour, uh, it's the same tour guide that's on every bourbon tour. He goes, you know what makes the world's best whiskey and the world's fastest racehorses? That limestone water. That limestone race water. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, you've seen it. You've, you've met him. I think that's, uh, I think everybody in Kentucky has to go through that training at a distillery. It's, it's, pretty, it's required. Pretty, pretty it's common. Like, pretty common. Let's get their license. So I saw the corollary between uh, whiskey and thoroughbred racehorses. Uh, they both take money, time, effort, and energy, but when they hit, they hit. So I half loved the name, half was pandering to Brown Foreman, who I knew loved horses and came up with thoroughbred. Uh, and as mentioned, we, we got a, ended up getting a all cash offer from a private office. So we sold, uh, but the idea stuck with me and that was 2009 and hung up my shingle, um, started and got our first client who, uh, was an equine doctor. So I think he hired us more for our name more than anything else. But kept my head down, ended up uh, growing the business on the side, uh, ended up taking a uh, job with Proximo Spirits for a while, which was a great experience. And on Proximo, I was on the team that bought Hangar One Vodka and Stranahan's Colorado Whiskey. And then I moved from New York to San Francisco uh, to build a new distillery for Hangar. And that's when I met the lovely people at St. George Spirits out in Alameda. Uh, fell in love with them, fell in love with what I was doing, and was uh, able to grow thoroughbred enough where I could eventually bring in my fiance, who's now my wife. And that was about 2011. And since that time, we kept our head down. We're now a team of 18. Uh, since 2009, we've built nearly 40 physical distilleries, launched over 50 brands, uh, and have brought three companies to exit. So, so why source? No, I'm just kidding. That was, so a, that was a fantastic, fantastic introduction. I mean, that was, that is quite the, quite the history and legacy of just kind of everything from your grandparents and 
kind of how you grew up into this business to to mm -hmm. kind of see what it is. And Thanks those are some great numbers as well to kind of back up the we'll keep on the, the thoroughbred thing, the pedigree of of mm -hmm. what you're you're doing as well. Thanks for that. So kind of talk about, you know, give us one of those ideas of those early successes. Um, you know, I, I kind of want to hear one of those exits. I want to hear one of those. Sure. So I think the with keeping names aside, um there's well, no, it's public. I can tell you about this one. So it's Few Spirits is one that probably would resonate the loudest Paul, with you. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So Grain of Glass, right? Uh, one of the first, one of the early stage of this movement, you know, craft distillers um, got started for, you know, a couple million dollars. The small barrels, you know, really small facility, you know, tiny pot still, under a year of age, $50 price tag, all that, you know, all the magical stuff that happened back then. Yeah, I was to say, a lot of the things that we look at today, we might be like, Those are, are these red flags? Yeah, yeah. Should, should I not invest? But, you know, so different times. And Paul was certainly well ahead of the curve. And uh, we became quite close with his business partner, a um, gentleman named Todd Paul, who's freaking brilliant. And Todd realized that their issue was scale. And, you know, this, this was a classic thing at the time where this was a, a right at the moment where it's craft whiskey, I gotta try it, to now I'm starting to get judged, right? And what I think is, what I refer is to rational versus emotional benefit, which I think will come and play here in a little bit, but I really love that it's from Chicago. I really love the packaging. I like Paul, it's a nice story. But for $50, I can get a lot of other products. Uh, one of my benchmarks is Eagle Rare depending on where you live. Back in the day, it was always available. 10-year age statement, 10 year. $30, $35. Yep, $29.99 yeah. at Benny's all day long. It's really hard, right? I mean, that's, that's what you're up against. And it's $20 cheaper, right? And so, you know, I'm guessing most of the people who listen to this are really passionate and aficionados and, you know, wouldn't even think twice about spending $50. But $50 is a lot of money. It's a lot of money in general. And it's a lot of money to a person who just kind of drinks a bottle maybe once every other week or something like that, or goes through a bottle every other week. So that emotional, rational benefit was really when things started to play. And so um, we affectionately refer to it as map lighters, but a distiller will get a call from a distributor outside of their home state. I've heard about you and I read about you in Whiskey Advocate. And, you know, how would you like to be in, you know, uh, Idaho? And you're like, well, Sure. Great. Why not? Let's sign um, some paper. I'll ship you a pallet. <laughs> ship you a pallet. Don't right? sue me. Um, exactly. <laughs> right. And then they go to me. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, you know, and so you, you look at their website and you're like, wow, you're in 25 states. What do you need thoroughbred for? You're doing great. You're growing. And the reality is that uh, very affectionately, their Colorado distributor actually went out of business two years ago um, when we started working with few. Uh, we're like, you know, they're not answering. They're not, emails are bouncing back, you know those kind of things. So we had to, to recenter, uh, readjusted the price, uh, the 55, $55. Then I think the rye was 60. Yeah. 49.99, 59.99. And then we just brought things back. You know, Paul had all the great foundations of all the product. Um, but the issue is scalability, right? You know, Paul's making everything grain to glass view, making everything grain to glass, but how do you really grow? And so when you look at the, uh, acquirer who was, uh, Samson and Surrey, uh, another fine group, um, you know, when you look at the values and the multiples, it's really hard because it's done off of net revenue and you're saying, well, look, I can double capacity, but now I'm only at 10,000 cases, quadruple capacity. Now I'm only at 25,000 cases, you know, essentially, right? Not a really big business at the end of the day versus you look at something like High West, which was, you know, predominantly source-based product, kind of an endless supply. So when an acquirer, a strategic acquires the business, they want to know that the foundation of their, there's basically 10 reasons why a strategic will look at an investment, but one of them is scalability. And so if I can't scale the business, the valuation is really low or in comparison, you may not even have a deal. So you have to think about those things when you're looking at what the value is of your business and how you define success, which is the number one question you got to ask. So, you know, people who are, are opposed to sourcing. Um, I get it. I really do. Uh, but as the entrepreneur, as the distiller, you have to ask that question. What does success look like for me? And what are my values and standards? How do I want to be portrayed? What is it that that label, that invitation there, what does that say about me? 
And because of the passion, a lot of times the person's ethos, entire being is representative in their product. Yeah. Which is why I think so people are so passionate about one way or the other. Yeah. And then people are passionate about the, you know, it, and it's probably hard for a lot of the distillers to let go of that, maybe that green to glass mentality to say sure. like, you know, if it's not built here kind of attitude and they are very hyper-focused on it and thinking that they're going to lose all of the value that they are providing in it and providing, you know, that uniqueness that they think that they're giving to the their consumers. How does somebody approach you and... and how do you start those conversations that says, okay, well, tell me what scale you're at and what scale do you want to be at? I mean, is that kind of the initial thinking when you go into it? Spirits of French Lick pays tribute to the many distilleries that once dotted the Southern Hills of Indiana. They focus on using the best practices of those early times in balance with the improved methods of today, delivering the finest handcrafted bottled and bond bourbons to an audience that's eager for an alternative to the big guys. Their distilling philosophy is balanced between the distiller's art and the contribution of the barrel, time, and patience to bring you an unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. Spirits of French Lick's motto is simple, respect the grain. You can find all Spirits of French Lick's products and their new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it, find out for yourself. And check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to always drink responsibly. Savor every drop of summer at Total Wine & More, because they've got a sizzling lineup of pours for the great outdoors. Get ready for the holiday weekend with their top 12 wines under $15, and beat the heat with refreshing bourbon cocktails. So why not serve a brown derby made with bourbon, grapefruit, and honey at your next barbecue? Then taste your way to a new flavorite. With over 500 bourbons, Total Wine & More is the place for whiskey lovers. Looking for something new? Well, check out McFarland's Reserve Kentucky Straight Bourbon. Extra wheat in the mash bill makes it especially smooth. You're sure to find cool prices on over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers in-store or at TotalWine.com. Heaven Hill Distillery has been lifting America's spirit since 1935. They celebrate American whiskey's rich traditions, guide its evolution, and champion its exciting future. For Heaven Hill, whiskey is more than a profession. It's a personal passion that is poured into every bottle, shared with newcomers and aficionados alike. So whether you enjoy the simple pleasure of Evan Williams bottled and bond, or savored that uniquely satisfying experience of a rare single barrel bourbon like Elijah Craig 18 year old, you'll find a home at Heaven Hill. If you want to learn more about the craft and techniques of making quality American whiskey, check out the educational resources and sign up for their newsletter at heavenhilldistillery.com. And Heaven Hill reminds you to think wisely and drink wisely. Cheers. How does somebody approach you and how do you start those conversations that says, okay, well, tell me what scale you're at and what scale do you want to be at? I mean, is that kind of the initial thinking when you go into it? It's a bit. So we have two types of clients. And so we have people who are group of entrepreneurs, 100 husband and wife team, you know, uh, could be a conglomerate winery that wants to get into spirit space. So brand new, right? Haven't started. And then are about half as well as people who are three to five years of age, you know, 10 year, five or 10 years of age, right? So how do they get to the next level? They've the got coach? some product, but they're they trying to figure product. out how to, how to really make it well known. Where are they going? Mm -hmm. Right. And so again, that first question is defining success and there's no right or wrong answer. There's a right or wrong way to build the business based upon your answer. And so if you said, look, this is something that my name is on the label. These are my values. I believe in you know transparency. I believe in making things with my own hands. This is part of why I'm doing it. This is something that I want to hand down to my children. That's one answer. It happens to be an answer I really you know relate to, but it's one answer. The opposite side of that equation can be, listen, I, this is something I just really want to scale and exit. You know, I see the multiples. I saw what George Clooney did, et cetera. You know. You'd be like, don't, don't did, think that's going to happen to yeah. you. That's, that's a rare there's, case. There's, there's a big, there's a big uh, asterisk next to that. But there's nothing wrong with looking at it from a business perspective. It's perhaps not how, what I would personally do, but I certainly get it. And so understanding that, uh, regardless of where you fall in that equation, it's critical that you're always building enterprise value because your son or your daughter may not want the business. Something may happen to you health-wise. You may change your mind or opinion about the whole space. 
And if you didn't build your business with value in mind, it's not worth as much as it could be. At the same time, if you're looking to scale and you are sourced, that's a big part of the equation as well. How quickly did you scale there? You know, look at something like Angel's Envy. How did you get to where you are? Uh, How long did it take to get there? How reliable is your source? You know, those type of things. And so it's always about enterprise uh, value and maximizing that. So no matter where that answer falls. Now, you mentioned reliability of source. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people that are, as of recent, are trying to figure out, gosh, what do we do? And they're, they're scrambling because they had purchased a bunch of eight to 13 year old MGP, 36% Mm -hmm. that everybody wanted, everybody loved it. And those are, those are clear. Those are gone. And now they've got to figure out, okay, how do we take this four to five year old stuff that we can get our hands on and make that available? Do you see this happen more often than not? It, it does. And uh, that MGP stuff is delicious. The, one of our, our projects a couple of years ago is we put um, a half a billion dollars to work in the new make production space. Uh, you can figure out who the company is. But in essence, you know, when you looked at the market, we analyzed it with them. And they're very smart, uh, very, very smart. And you looked at it and you said, where's this market headed? What's the actual inventory on hand? And, you know, right now, four to five would be a dream to catch, you know, especially if you're looking at, you know, Kentucky or Tennessee based product. And that's normally one to two years of age. Now, even MGP, uh, as of this time is, you know, you'd be lucky to find anything much over three, which is a big question, what's going to happen in time. But right now it's the reliability of that, because if you put your label out there based upon a source, this is the whole risk equation consistency, you know, does your brand relate to that? And a big part of that is buying and not just buying what you have today, but buying something a little bit younger and a little bit younger and a little bit younger. And then eventually you get into new make, which your, your cost of acquisition is much lower. And so it's not cheap to get into sourcing, to do sourcing, right? There, there's plenty of brands that, you know, they buy a handful of barrels at a time, you know, and I would gently refer to that as a hobby based business. Uh, but when you have a real plan and you've thought through it and you've had that consistency in mindset and transparency in mindset uh, and cost in mind, that's a brand that you can really grow and get behind. Yeah. I mean, are you seeing a lot of people today starting to scramble because they didn't have that plan in mind and they, they started with a product and now they can't get that product or what's, what, what do you kind of see in the market well, happening right now? Well, none of our clients, obviously. Um, but obviously, uh, <laughs> obviously not. Like, you can't come to Thoroughbred unless you have a plan. Yeah, exactly. I will create it for you. Um, but no, in all seriousness, yeah, there's, there's brands that because of the, uh, and it's, 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 you know, it's a good problem, but it's still a problem. The bourbon game is just incredibly hot. You know, there are collectors, there are buyers, there's single barrel programs, you know, the cocktails are hot. Um, the whole mixologist, you know, certainly saw an uptick. So there's a lot of brands who, even when they planned well, um, the volumes just far exceeded it. You know, we, we work with the fine family at Logstill here in Kentucky. We've blown out our first year projections in the first two months. You know, it's wonderful, but it's still a problem. I was about to say, when something like that happens, what do you do? Or do you just say, you're not, there's not any more product for another year? So the big thing, what used to be a, a perspective is, oh, it's allocated. And that was magical words. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's, let's go ahead and just tell everybody that's the that's the word behind it. Yeah. Uh, but what you've essentially done is incredibly pissed off your distributor and you know mentioned many of your retailers and then your consumers as well, especially if it's something that's meant to be for more every day. Again, that rational and emotional benefit. So essentially, we've just curled uh, the launch plans so that making sure that the market of Kentucky, our first launch market, was well supported and you know it's consistent and the products available. How do you? advise somebody that is like a log still or somebody else that says, okay, we've got all this product. Let's go ahead and open up in six different states. Or do you say, let's own your backyard or let's own a core market? How do you provide that sort of insight? Sure. You're going to get tired of this answer, but again, it comes back to what they're trying to do, right? So if they're looking, you know, log still is all about legacy, right? Um, the Dan family, it's all about legacy. So they have a very long view. And then the big proponents when you have somebody who thinks that way uh, is depth versus breath, right? So I want to make sure that I'm not just in the state, but I'm well seated in the state that, you know, I'm not just in the hot bars. I'm also in the local bars and the people who really know, you know, I just didn't get my top 25 list from my distributor 
sold them and moved on. And, you know, in their particular case, you know, they're Kentucky proud, right? And so they want to make sure that they're really supporting their home market very well. Uh, so we pushed back, for example, Tennessee. We we're supposed to launch in August, September this year. We're going to push it back to February, March next year, right? Just because of the growth and the success we've had so far. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one thing to, you know, go far and wide versus long and deep. And that's something that even we try to struggle with to try to figure out what do we do mm-hmm. because we've got people all the time that say, oh, I can't get it in North Carolina. Yep. I really wish you were in California. And we just, we're like, ah, sorry. I mean, it's, yep. it's one of the things that we try to, you know, think about all the time too. Sure. Well, and, and there's, there's some platforms. So again, it kind of depends on your brand. So if you're, what I would say, if you're a really high end brand, very limited, you know, special to release, each batch is kind of different. So it's kind of one off type relationship. There's platforms like LibDib, right? Or uh, even Park Street or MHW have some kind of self-distribution platforms, right? Where you get into some two or three retailers. Uh, there's some online retailers that, you know, claim they can get you in like 30 states of distribution. Like near, kind of salt kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, be super careful, um, you know, because we're, we're pretty tight with the TTB because uh, the amount of questions we ask them. Um, and a lot of them aren't vetted yet. So- uh, but it's something like that. You just say, look, we really appreciate it. It's wonderful. Uh, if you live in these states, we'd love to help you out as we grow. We'll hold on to your contact information, you know, and that's another way to keep that contact and that, that service related because eventually you'll be there. But if you go to that map lighter philosophy, if you end up appealing to or trying to appease everybody, you appease no one. So again, depth versus breath. And if you look at, I'm not a beer guy, so I'll mess this up, but what was it? Coors that never expanded or, you know, the Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania company. Um, that never expanded outside, you know, uh, west of the Mississippi. You had a cult following. You know, you had people literally who drive oh, hundreds Yingling of miles. Yingling, yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, see, I told you to know much beer. Um, <laughs> great. But, I'm here for you. Thank you, brother. So, but you you have a cult following. You know, people look for you and and search for it. And it also comes with a little cachet. So hold on to your values, stick with your right proper distribution. When you can service a market adequately, that's when you do it. So when do you go into somebody and say, you know what, I don't know if sourcing is the right move for you. How does, has something like that ever came up? It it, it sure has. Um, We are very fortunate to work with a lot of farm families, Uh, something that resonates, you know, deep, as I mentioned in my previous personal story. And that's something where it's about their land, you know, their, their entire being is in that field. And that's something you just got to respect. And, you know, the big question we ask is that, how comfortable are you with this? You know, when I see this or I show you this brand, what's your reaction? And if there's ever a bit of negativity or uncomfortability with something like that, we say don't, right? Because the, the thing is, is that when you make this a business business, you lost, right? This, there's, there's way too much energy and passion, time, money, resources that are required to be successful in the spirits business. And if it just becomes a widget, or a commodity, or just something you're doing, you, and the passion is gone, the failure rate is super high, right? It's that motivation, it's that energy that keeps people going. It's also what people buy. So when you look at the spirit, you know there there doesn't there really isn't a need for another distillery to launch. You know at the end of the day, right? If you just break it down as alcohol as a unit of measure, there's plenty of production. You're between not, the big the big guys and the other two thousand craft distilleries out there, yeah. you're not solving a problem. But what you are can do is create an emotion. You're creating an emotional connection. And so when your heart isn't into it, that's going to be felt. And also that's not what you need to do. So when it does come to that and you can feel it, just sense it. When that person just, it's not for them, that's okay. And then there's a way to do it, by the way, which is let us define success as we talked about. Let's create your estate portfolio. But are you open to something that's source that's a different name, different brand that's not associated directly with your distillery? It's still under your guidance, but it allows us to scale. It meets the financial reasonings we do to be able to allow you to do the stuff you're super it, passionate about. It pays for everything pays else for that you want to go play with. Yeah, it's the classic vodka pays the bill concept. But there's a way to do that. You say, okay, well, as long as my family's name is not on this particular label, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I mean, that's that makes sense. And I think that's probably a really good formula, I think, for anybody that is out there that thinks, because you had mentioned most people, they'll start a distillery, they'll make whiskey, and then the other day they'll switch it off and make vodka and gin one day, and sure. rum or whatever it is that they can kind of 
really just turn around and sell tomorrow versus, all right, we'll, we'll see in two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years and we'll hope for the best. Right. Um, but you do need, I mean, in what new riff with OKI, it's, it's a fantastic, you know, fantastic uh, case of being able to show exactly this is what happens with, with source whiskey. Mm-hmm. And you can completely take your name away from the brand as well that, you know, it's not even associated with them anymore. Correct. And, and so you, you have that control. Um, now, the other thing when I want to think about this and kind of help our our listeners understand is that none of this comes cheaply. Sourced whiskey, uh, getting into the business is is very front loaded. It's a it's a heavy business. Sure. When somebody comes and they say, "Okay, like I think I I want to, you know, whether I have a family distillery, I want to start sourcing and have a secondary brand, or or maybe this is my my core goal with it is to just do a, a build a source brand." Do you say, all right, well, what's your target? This is what it's going to cost you. Like, how do you start those conversations? Yeah. So a lot of it is is having realistic expectations on capital. So I'll give you a real case study. So we have the pleasure of uh, working with the O'Shaughnessy family out of Minnesota. Some of the finest people on the planet. They are uh, super loving, very family oriented, uh, very Irish, and they wanted to get into the Irish whiskey business. And so we started talking and we started, you know, you really can't make Irish whiskey hint hint in the US, uh, no matter how much you try to emulate it, it's not <laughs> going to be the there's same. There's something that, that's said about having that word Irish next yeah, to it. Yeah, something you know. about it. Um, so we talked about sourcing and then also building a distillery. And fast forward, it's now a f- north of $40 million project, uh, millions in uh, new make and aged whiskey, uh, as well as the hiring of Brian Nation, you know, the former master distiller of Jameson. So that's the way to do it, do it. Um, understanding if the capital. All in, yeah, that's, a, that's an all in. That's the 100% thing. grand yeah. slam, right? And so when I um, was presenting to the family about, you know, what's the, what are the options? You know, you can source, you can build your own distillery here in Minnesota. I said, or there's this option. And so that's, you know, that's the grand slam, you know, and that's a rare opportunity for many people, but it's perfectly the right one for them. And so the, the heart of it is that it's a, it's a serious investment upfront and investing in sourced. But in their case, uh, it's also displaying a really beautiful thing, which is the art of the blend. And that's not something that I, I very respectfully, I don't think we really celebrate here in the US. Uh, Canada, you know, their entire production process is essentially based upon the art of the blend. Ireland, Scotland, even Japan is based upon the art of the blend. And some would argue, just to clarify, I have uh, two master distillers on staff and they're both Canadian. They would argue that the real art is in the blend and the distillation is important, very important, but the real beauty, the real knowledge happens in the blend. And when you can do that and you can really understand the nuances there, it's, it's something amazing to see. Then you can look at it and you can say, wow, you make great juice, but every time I taste a bottle of your product, there's just something not right. It's the blend. It's the maturation. That's the, you know, putting everything together. Uh, making with all the paint buckets and all the paint colors of your different barrels and how they come to be. So there, there's true art in that, uh, and there's true skill, and then there's true capital to really do it right. Yeah, I think the capital is this one that might throw people for a loop because you'll be like, oh, wait, oh, oh, a couple million. Oh, okay, right. yeah, that's just one of those things where maybe the light bulbs don't turn on for some people. Yeah, so here's some simple math. And if you're listening in the car or driving, but just I'll, I'll try and keep it as easy as possible because uh, I'm not a big math guy either. Yeah, but, I, I need my spreadsheet. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm pretty good when it comes to Excel. So you have, let's just take a four-year-old Kentucky bourbon. Let's just say it's $22 to $2,500 a bottle, a barrel. Um, that's on the low end. That's on the low end. Yeah. If you can find it, but let's just say you can find it. Um, and then you'll get uh, like a two-year-old that might be 1800 and then a one-year-old might be twelve hundred. Well, a new make, depending on your volume and who you work with, could be anything from five fifty to seven fifty. So there's a lot of appreciation in that time period. But as mentioned, and especially if you want to have smart finances and eventually the best cost, because again, rational emotional benefit. You're if you're charging, and you saw this, if you're charging three thousand dollars plus for a barrel, which is pretty much the upper echelon of what you can charge. Your end product ends up being about seventy nine ninety nine to a hundred dollars plus. Are there people who buy that? Yeah, it's probably everyone on this podcast a buyer of that. Yeah, assuming everything matches there, but that's not the average public. So you're limited. You're small, and you even saw some of the uh, savvier ones who would buy 
like a 10 or 12 year old and blend it with their two and three year old that maybe they make themselves, you know, Breckenridge is an example, right? Make two, three year old product, buy some source product, put it together and it's something really beautiful, but you couldn't just make it all 10 year old or four year old or six year old product. You had to find a way to adjust the cogs there. And so the short of it is you want to, especially if you're thinking financially savvy, you got to get the upper echelon stuff that you can buy today and sell today, then a little bit younger, then a little bit younger and a little bit younger so that your cogs actually blends out. And now you become a uh, greater profitability, but also a lower cost of acquisition. And you'll notice uh, many brands uh, are doing like bottled and bond, uh, four-year-old product, hunter proof, $39.99. Why is $39.99 so important? Tell me, why is it? It's the on-premise cost per ounce, right? Thirty-nine ninety-nine is the upper echelon of what you can charge to a bar. You know, after you know going through wholesale pricing, for them to be able to make a cocktail with it, right? So you want to be in a Manhattan, right? You want to get your Angels Envy poured. You want to get uh, your new Riff poured. You know, insert brand here, Castle and Key. You've got to be at under forty bucks a bottle whole retail, which then works out the math wholesale so they get the cost per ounce below about a dollar twenty-five an ounce. That's the volume. That's mm -hmm. the value. So that's that upper echelon uh, premium, rational, emotional benefit, but also volume. Right. Critical. I'll, I'll throw one more your way. Sure. Um, because, you know, you, we talk about being able to do volume. We talk about prices. Uh, and I think one that might be an outlier that is Kentucky Owl. Like Kentucky Owl was, I mean, they were charging $200 a bottle and they still were getting bought out by somebody. And that is way beyond the upper echelon. Yeah. So there's always outliers. And if you look at um, very smart people behind it, um, very talented, again, art of blending, part of it was time, uh, very slick when it came to allocation, distribution, you know, kind of the underground world. And it was a big more of a statement piece than anything to have it. Respectable packaging, not great packaging, right? And it was just this perfect combination of all these things coming together. And uh, heavy use of the word limited, right? In that batch series stuff, right? You know, what they either did it by years or by batches. I like think batch six, yeah, I think, is when right. Deadman sold. Or I think it was, I think batch nine was his last one. That's when yeah. he sold something like that. So super smart, right? But that, if that's your business model, that, there's a good amount of luck. And in that particular case, very historic brand. Uh, I think a lot of the initial introduction happened in Kentucky and out of the bed and breakfast, you know. So there's some really nice preceding that happened that. And then the timing, right? Timing was everything with this. That's awesome. Well, yeah. you know, Scott, I, I think we could probably talk for another hour on this stuff, but we're already we're already hitting the, the time minute sure. or the, the marker here. But, you know, for anybody that says, you know, I, I kind of want to start a business or I want to yeah. learn more about what's going on here. Scott, how can people find out more about you and where do they find you and get in contact with you? Oh, that's very thoughtful. Um, you're welcome to check us out at T is in Tom, B is in Bravo, spirits.com. So it's TB, which is the initials for a thoroughbred horse. TBSpirits.com. And you can write us at info at TBSpirits.com is the, the best way. And always happy to chat with folks. Um, we have no expectations when we get an inbound that we're going to do business together, but we love being helpful. So even if you have some questions or, you know, struggling with something, we're always happy to entertain those. Yeah, those you got an questions. inbound to say, hey, can you come on a podcast? And you're like, hey, <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> but Scott, it was it was a pleasure. I think any pleasure as we, well. We we definitely learned a lot, and I think you you enlightened a few people. And dear God, your your history and your your you know everything that that kind of amounted to what you're doing today is is incredible. It's a, it's a great story of your family and how you were kind of really born into it. And at some point, I want to see what this uh, elixir is all about. Hopefully, we can we got, got a some. bottle somewhere. We've so. got some. I promise. <laughs> yeah. I promise. Thank you. Be able to try it. So make sure you reach out to them in case you have any questions whatsoever. If you want to follow Bourbon Pursuit, you can do it on all the socials at Bourbon Pursuit. And if you like what you hear, make sure you tell a friend, leave a review, whatever it is, and share the good word of bourbon. But with that, cheers, everybody. And we'll see you all next week.